Hi, my name is Steven Edger. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Deluxe. Uh, I'm also known as Disregard Fiat on Steam. Uh, I guess I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the blockchain works and uh, how I like to think about it. So this is a kinetic art sculpture called Decisions by Georg Traber, maybe? I'm going to talk about the blockchain and how it relates to this. Um, let's see. In general, computers are just a bunch of switches. They process ones or zeros, or what we call ones and zeros, and what they actually are closer to marbles. They are either there or not there. Um, as a Steam transaction is basically somebody is trying to make a change to a database or create a new entry in a database every time they are signing a, a Steam transaction. So, for instance, if it is a transact, like you want to transfer 10 Steam to, say, me or uh, Roboto Lux to fund our development at Deluxe, you sign a transaction that says, hey, I'd like to send 10 Steam to Roboto Lux. Uh, you take your private key, um, hash that with a transaction, send it off to the blockchain, the RPC node looks at it much like this machine here, and orders it, puts it in a queue, and the witness nodes process this transaction, and make sure all of the things go through and everything is balanced out at the end. This is uh, how a directed acyclic graph works. Um, and so, like, as you can see here, um, if everything lines up correctly at the end, then the whole thing starts over again. Kind of like all of these marbles are transactions in a block. Cycle repeats. Or all of these are options in a transaction cycle repeats um, so that's fun that is kind of like how the blockchain works in my mind it is just a machine that is looking at a whole bunch of transactions and determining what to do about those transactions so I work a lot with Mark Giles and when we originally had our concept for Deluxe we were looking for places to put virtual reality on the blockchain. We were thinking of ways to like say stream 360 video because um, we, we weren't really uh, happy with the interactivity that YouTube provided at the time and of course YouTube and the censorship evolved with Facebook and all those things that they just weren't conducive so when we saw DTube and we saw like oh they're just putting this information in this custom JSON place over here. And that opened us up to make our experiences. So at the time, there was nothing really that existed like this. Um, for instance, this is a web app. Um, it runs in A-frame, and you can see that it is a virtual reality thing. This is just on the internet. It holds this animation. I can walk around. If there's other people in here, I can put devices, anything. Um, this gets actually really complex. So complex, in fact, that I can use it to say hi and put digital overlays also from the blockchain onto real objects in the real world. Um, these are D apps that are put into containers on the blockchain. So this one, for instance, uh, made $101, uh, probably mostly through BidBot advertising, but the idea is I still have all of the information that was on Steam here, as well as the marker that I used to display it, and a link. So all I have to do is point my phone's camera at a QR code, and it pulls up this dApp container. There are no ads, there are no middlemen, there are no fees, there are no private databases. This is everything that's needed to run lives on Deluxe.io and just as easily can live on your computer. So the rest of Deluxe.io, of course, looks like this. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, the, I guess, like how this works already. Hmm... This is Steam Peak. I, I really like Steam Peak, by the way, for um, interacting with Steam as a blog. blog. So, uh, like we said before, um, Steam is made up of people. And all of the Steamians over there have transactions. 
and once they sign these transactions, they'll send them off to the RPC. And that RPC will put those transactions, order them. Um, they will determine the order of those transactions. The witnesses will then take all of those transactions do the operations to the Steam database inside of a block and sign those blocks off. So you can see what this looks like a lot like over here when you go to a Steam Block Explorer and see what a block looks like. And a block is made up of operations. So some of these operations, this is probably a custom JSON operation. Um, but all of these are just different kinds of operations that tell the Steam blockchain to do different things. So everything from transfer to vesting shares to a limit order cancel, they're all just signed operations, just you, ways that you would interact with a computer yourself. But in this case, you're sharing a computer. So here you go. Back over here. Um, now, Steam has um, a client called DSteam, and what that does is it lets you stream the blockchain. All right, so DSteam, you can ask for these blocks, and these blocks will pop out, and you can do the exact same thing to these things as well. So this, this is how Steam Monsters work. Steam Monsters, these guys here, somebody will make a Steam Monsters transaction that'll get put in here, ordered, and the DSteam client over here that Steam Monsters transaction will trigger a transaction in the Steam Monsters database. So Steam Monsters is over here maintaining their database of who has what. And if Steam Monsters releases their uh, server-side code, anybody can verify with the Steam transactions what has occurred in their database, who has transferred what, and it's an audible record maintained by the blockchain. So Steam Monsters is using all of this infrastructure to verify their database, which is really cool. Um, you can do a lot with this. Uh, they're demonstrating that you can build a card game, and most certainly you can. It is a crypto asset, and these assets can, in fact, represent just about anything. So let's see. I'm going to show you how we use this information. So we use this information because some of these will be posts. Well, sign transaction will be a post. And that post will contain custom JSON information much like D2 does and that will be a hash which will contain an address. So let's go back over here. This might be here. This frame, I'm going to show you the page source. This is the frame source, sorry. So the page um, is coming from Deluxe.io. If you look at this page, uh, yeah, is there a way to do this? see just what is going on. All right, so this is the... All right, so this is the iframe, this is what's in the iframe, this is what's outside the iframe. Um, in this case, it's mostly just us trying to talk to Steam, so pulling the information from Steam, and then giving ourselves a UI to interact with an iframe. So the deluxe layer is a single sign-on service for dApps. So if you go to deluxe.io and you sign in here, when you... 
this QM stat. So let's say deluxe.io. It gives you a page. This page is this page with this address right here. Inside that page is an iframe. That iframe has this hash. If you're familiar with web security, which I'm sure some of you will be, um, this subdomain here makes sure that it has its own local storage. The subdomain is just the lowercase version of its hash. The hash here is the location that is stored at in the blockchain. So when this content is loaded into here, it does not have access to Deluxe.io or its cookies. Its cookies include your Steam Connect information or any of your Steam stuff. So all of its abilities to interact with the blockchain. All it knows is who you are. So it passes in your username, like say Disregard Fiat. And I have a long name. That I can't spell in order. Put that in there. This has your own local storage. So each D app comes equipped with its own local storage, which you can put keys into, which you can do whatever, because it is only on the user's computer, only on the client side. Uh, cookies also you can put at this level, um, at the subdomain. So this lets users come back to these apps. If you came over here and looked, it's also passing in undefined. Um, this is a little bit curious because right now undefined just means there's nothing to pass in. And it's just passing in nothing. It could just as easily be any set of variables that you want. So um, earlier when I was showing you the camera app where I was putting a digital overlay on that QR code, Mm, oh well. That QR code that contained this link could just as easily contain this link plus any number of variables. So if I come over here and take this and put my variables back here, let's say I have a menu uh, application and this menu is at store equals let's say one and table equal four and chair or seat whatever equal two so now I do that And now when I go to this frame and view the frame source, I also have store, table, and seat information on this frame. This means this application that is nothing more than a QR code can also be aware of its location. It can be aware of any information that is attached to that QR code um, that makes 1D app utilized for much more than just uh, like the single purpose. So you can build your own state machines as D apps and put them wherever you'd like. So back over here to Sketchpad. You have for free just by posting on Steam your own local storage and subdomain. This, if you want to look at the internet as a crazy environment. This is where Facebook is. This is where YouTube is. This is where Twitter is. This is where Steam is. This is where VR, XR, AR, building anything yourself is. Because over here, any anything past say like here, we need like AWS. How how do you power your infrastructure? How do you uh, where do you put all of this data that you make? There's there's typing stuff in on Facebook and saying post, 
and there's pushing go live on YouTube and having a camera app pop up. But that's not your information. You're letting other people advertise to you. You're giving them your information so you can be advertised to. Um, over here, you're the product. And we all know that we're going toward decentralization distribution. So Deluxe.io, again, is just its own web app. It is, you can download this and run it on your own computer just as easily. Uh, this is a token software, but Deluxe.io, download it from GitHub. Do I have GitHub open? <laughs> no. All right, so GitHub, this is me, disregard fiat. My organization and deluxe.io where you can download this. Here are the instructions. Run it on your computer. There are no private databases. This runs without any additional support. It runs off of uh, public APIs provided by Steam. The token software, on the other hand, um, well, this particular infrastructure is cool, where you have your own local storage and subdomain. Things get a little interesting when you say want to do something more than just provide content. Like I was saying, uh, these D apps can pass in stuff like tables and whatnot for menus or in any way you want to interact with these applications in the real world. What if you want to interact with people across applications? What what if you want to do your own database management, your own CMS, use Steam as a subscription model? Um, there's so many more things that your cryptocurrency can do for you that just isn't covered by posting on Steam. So let's get back to the sketchpad and let's talk about what the the idea behind deluxe token architecture was and how that evolved into something a lot better. So initially, Steam was going to come out with something called SMTs. And these SMTs were going to let our Steam communities, so in this case, the deluxe community and anybody who posted with deluxe, to monetize the content on different rules than Steam proper has. So it would allow us to tokenize our product, which is an infrastructure, more like a, uh, a platform as a utility than a, than a service. And hopefully encourage the growth of the community through this tokenization, making bounties and driving um, attention through the price of the token. However, the SMTs, they uh, are failing to materialize in time. So our uh, cool friend, Shred7, came up with Steam State. I had been mostly um, working along the lines of how do you put web apps like these into containers and serve them so that users can do this. Well, not that, but whatever they want to do using decentralized and distributed technologies we can now do all of these things so this is the deluxe token software i guess i have to scroll over here what this does is it keeps track of all of those things so when me and mark were hoping to build a platform to host virtual reality we didn't want to think about advertisers we wanted to fight censorship. We wanted to have an infrastructure that just was there. Um, not anything that we necessarily had to learn, but it didn't exist. So guess what? We had to learn. Um, when things aren't going our way, we, you know, fix it. So like I was saying before, Steam Monsters maintains this database of signed transactions that manipulate the Steam Monsters database on the this side. What you can do instead of just 
manipulating your card database is manipulate your entire organization's database. So in Ethereum, they had this concept called the DAO. And this is what split Ethereum into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic because somebody made a DAO and somebody stole a lot of money from the DAO. However, the organizational structure is what is necessary in the future because this structure for governance, uh, let's see, does that look like a court enough, government, whatever, it's not working. What we do need is something that's just based on math. So going back to the token architecture, What this does is it gives us an additional level. So the SMT is not coming, but all an SMT is is a database just like Steam. So we made our own database. Big deal. Much like Steam Monsters, it doesn't do much. Uh, it holds information just like Steam does. What makes Steam special is its immutability. So Steam's immutability is contributing to Steam Monster's immutability in something called soft consensus, where you can convince anybody else that what you have is accurate by just giving them the initial conditions and the same program that you use to calculate your answer. What you can do instead is get a hard consensus, where you pull between people who are running softwares, and in this case it would be the same software, so Let's call this the deluxe token software. So the deluxe token software is being run, and what it can do is pull the other people who are running deluxe token software. Um, so in fact, what Steam is doing is pulling between each other, and they're sending out their messages and saying, this is my block signature, and that's how they're rewarding each other and maintaining the chain. This, this can be done, again, with a feedback loop. So utilizing Steam state, so this database, to, so going back to Steam Monsters, if, if Steam Monsters was run by more than one node, so let's say like Steam Monsters ran a node, Deluxe ran a Steam Monsters node, and Oh, uh, who else is a blockchain? Busy, sure. Busy ran a Steam Monsters node. So if all of these people came up and said at the end of whatever this accounting period was that, hey, this is my soft consensus in whatever way, like say a hash of the database at the end of the day, and they all put their hash of the database at the end of the day onto the blockchain in a custom JSON transaction that says, hey, verify uh, the Steam Monsters database every day, so daily. At each, each one of these databases can now look at the transactions, since they're already getting all of the transaction information anyway, and then say, hey, these guys all agree that my database is good. Check and hey, these guys can get a free or a reward card. Much like Bitcoin, much like anything else, uh, much like Steam where the witnesses pay themselves, uh, what is it, 15% or 10% of the total rewards on the blockchain go to the witnesses. These guys can pay themselves in Steam Monsters cards or deluxe tokens if they are running deluxe software. So that is how to develop a consensus using the blockchain as a gossip provider. Um, and by that I mean your signed transactions that are on your sweet little D-Steam conveyor belt to your sweet little robot Olux robot that does whatever you want who scans these transactions and manipulates a database so you don't have to.
And that database, which he's maintaining, also has a sweet little radio so that he can sign transactions and put them back. And since now all of these guys are decentralized and running the exact same software, they can agree and agree to reward themselves with entries in this database. So that is how to create a database like Steam Monsters or Deluxe on Steam. All right, so this is all fine and dandy, but you have a problem here. These databases are silos. And while this database can be compiled from the Steam database, you cannot just manipulate the Steam database easily with each of these databases because what these are doing, in fact, are just reporting hopefully the same information back to the blockchain. All of their transactions should say, hey, we've all verified this hash. You're not really, not really messing a lot with the Steam blockchain there. And this is especially detrimental when you're talking about price discovery. So right now, and much like anything else, Steam has this problem. So you have Steam over here, and you have Bitcoin over here. You have Ethereum over here, and these databases all have their prices for the tokens. So, you know, one piece of Bitcoin costs know, like 4K. One slice of Ethereum costs, what is it, like 100K? No, one, one, $100 right now. And... Uh, a slice of a Steam Monsters database currently, de depending on which slice it is, runs you anywhere between like, a, you know, 10 cents, a few dollars. And the Deluxe database is running pretty slim. We're talking like, like, like nothing. But, now, we already know how these databases get made. What is going to be a little bit different about Deluxe? What's different about Ethereum over Bitcoin? So, Bitcoin is revolutionary because it, for the very first time, allows peer-to-peer -peer transactions that nobody can stop. Theoretically, as long as Alice can sign a transaction and send it to the network, then the records should be updated. Everybody who runs Bitcoin can agree that this transaction will cause these changes to the database, thus making it immutable because of the agreement consensus of what has happened here. Ethereum takes this one step further and says, hey, instead of running transactions that are this simple, or in some cases on Bitcoin, this simple, what if we were to give you a magic function box where F can be anything that you can write in machine code? And that is the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Steam uh, has something pretty magical in it for a basic transaction. And this is what makes Steam 
even more special than like just the freemium aspect of it and what it can do. It, it's a publishing tool. It is a resource distribution tool. It is an escrow tool because now what if Alice doesn't just want to give Bob 10 of something? What if Alice wants to give Bob 10 of something when Bob sends her a pair of Nikes on eBay? So in that case, Alice sees Bob's transaction on eBay. And so we, we, let's, let's try this with Steam, but on eBay or somewhere. Whatever. There's an auction. There's an agent. And in this case, Alice wants to send Bob 10 Steam. But only if Bob sends her some sweet kicks. In this case, Alice can elect Charlie. That's not even close to how you spell Charlie. But Charlie over here can be an agent. Charlie can put his eyes on a transaction and say, hey, this happened. So on Steam, when Alice sends, Alice over here, she sends $20, or she has 20 Steam over here. Bob can see this transaction has been scheduled with Charlie as the agent and Bob as the recipient. He can then send these shoes and say, hey, I'd like my 10 Steam. Charlie sees that Bob has sent this transaction as well as any information that contains maybe tracking information, maybe a picture of those tennis shoes on the doorstep. Who knows what it is, but Charlie has been elected the agent. He can now figure it out and release those funds to Bob. So only after these shoes get to Alice will Bob have his tan steam, and Alice will have less money. Oh, that's not entirely true. Alice will have less money as soon as this transfer is initiated, but if the transfer fails, then she will get her money back. It is in limbo slash escrow until it comes back. All right, so back to this problem where you have separate databases, like, say, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Right now we have some super sweet people like Block Trades or Coinbase or you know anybody else like that who can take certain asset classes because they have assets themselves pooled up and they can exchange these assets for you. They can list all of the prices that have been paid for these exchanges and give an accurate tick. The Coinbase will do the same thing. Coinbase can exchange your fiat. This is all fine and dandy. When you have brand new resources though, block trades might not have a pool of your resources to trade. Coinbase won't have a pool of your resources to trade. And even Steam, won't have a way to trade the resources on its own platform. Because again, all you're doing is manipulating a database that is outside of itself. So we now have all of the tools we need to build the engine of tomorrow. So each one of these things are uh, this is what a pump looks like on a diagram, a centrifugal pump to be precise, and what they do is they take water and put energy into the water. But besides that, we're talking about steam transactions. So these are those little web workers earlier that are looking at all of the signed transactions that are identical across all of the streams. What we are doing is building immutable data that we can all trust. These things are all building a database. This database is a record of all of the balances and deluxe power over here. All of these guys agree to things and they're all already sending reports back to the blockchain about what their consensus is. 
if you already have a method to provide feedback to a system, then that feedback is extremely valuable. Um, like the marble earlier, marbles from earlier, you saw that they formed a cycle. The cycle was repeating and you're calculating off of it. The, the transactions in this case is anything that people themselves want to do and find valuable. If there's no value in something, it won't occur, especially on Steam where every transaction costs resources to make. So in this way, we can provide a little bit of feedback and utilize this feedback to bridge the gap between our Steam database and our deluxe database of tokens because we can utilize the escrow transaction in the Steam database to hold those capital pools in the middle for deluxe. Um, since this escrow transaction service is entirely held inside of Steam and everything that deluxe is happens entirely because of Steam, this escrow service has effectively bridged this gap and I will show you how. So normally, like we'll explain it, how block trades would do it. Block trades has a list of all of the previous transactions that occurs. So Alice goes over to block trades and she sees the order book. And for instance, right now it looks like 100 deluxe is going for 10 steam. So that's what Alice does. She says, hey, I would really like 10 steam for my 100 deluxe. She doesn't know who is going to be over here to complete this transaction. And this is why currently block trades is so important. They are the trusted third party. This is, this is something that the blockchain hasn't alleviated quite yet. While you can use decentralized exchanges where all of the members are operating in trust, such as um, why can I not remember the name of like Binance, Bitfinex? What was the other project? Ugh, whatever. Anyway. Alice here needs to make this transaction. And because she doesn't know who is over here to provide this, she needs somebody to hold this. On... What is the name of... Bit, Bitfinex? Binance? Bittrex? This is absurd. This is just driving me insane. Bit shares. That's what I want to do. Industrial grade decentralized DPoS ecosystem. Bit shares. In that case, bit shares is the intermediary. You have to do all of your trades to bit shares in order to facilitate the transactions. This is why there's usually not trading pairs between assets on BitShares. There are trading pair to BitShare, not trading pair to trading pair. Um, so in this case, block trades, BitShares, whoever it is, they are the trusted third party to build this transaction on the open-ended side. Alice wants Bob sees this transaction, can fund this contract, and these guys, whoever they are, can say, hey, this transaction has been fulfilled. Those coins go to Bob, and Alice grabs those coins from this contract. If no Bob is found, or the contract expires, Alice just gets her tokens back. So now, these same transactions would happen normally. Deluxe is um, a little different, however, because 
the deluxe token architecture, you have these workers that are looking at all of these signed transactions. Very happy to do so, by the way. And they are capable of performing actions on them. Each one of these workers also has Steam credentials. Those Steam credentials are used to put these back over here. When each one of these nodes has a Steam username, which means back here, hmm, Let's explain these, these transactions one more time using, uh, nope, 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 nope. All right, here we go. Alice is a smart cookie. She has purchased a lot of deluxe. Alice now wants to sell 100 of her deluxe for 10 steam. When Alice makes this request, she is doing so on Steam. She can only make this request with Alice's keys. Deluxe, in this case, is processing all of these transactions. Deluxe, as it processes these transactions, can place that 100, thing, 100 Deluxe tokens into escrow, into this contract, this open-ended contract. Because what Alice does when she um, makes this custom transaction is actually hoping that somebody else will buy an escrow transaction. So when Bob comes along and sees this, Bob is going to send 10 Steam to Alice through Deluxe. One of those nodes on Deluxe has a username that Bob can use to facilitate this escrow transaction. Since this transaction will also have a transaction ID, Bob just types it in. And I literally mean Bob just like types it in. Like, like that. And boom. He'll, he'll be able to, to buy this contract. Um, the transaction comes out. The agent in the middle, we'll call him Charlie again, will see that the contract is still there. Because if this wasn't a decentralized exchange where there isn't a trusted third party, David over here could do the same thing. David and Bob could both send a peer-to-peer -peer transaction to Alice just bypassing this contract, hoping that Deluxe sees this transaction with this transaction ID and cancels the contract. But we all know what happens if... Uh, the contract doesn't get canceled in time because these transactions take like 45 seconds to clear this through Steam because it has to go through the RPC server. It has to get picked up by the witnesses. It has to be put onto an irreversible block and then streamed out to Deluxe. Um, all of this stuff, you know, it doesn't take a long time, but it takes a good minute. And in that minute, if Alice has put out a really sweet price, then Bob, David... You know, Aaron and Frank all could send these transactions and only one of them would get these tokens because the rest of them would just be ignored. There's nothing that Deluxe could do. So Bob can send an escrow transaction through Charlie that only when and if this contract exists will Charlie get the instruction to release those funds to Alice and those funds to Bob. And if David over here does the same thing, Deluxe will say, hey, that contract doesn't exist anymore. Here's your money back. However, <laughs> Alice, Alice, she, she now realizes that she made, made a little bit of a mistake because the price has skyrocketed. Now she has 10 steam over here. And it'll purchase 50 Deluxe. So how, how does Alice now have uh, money to put somewhere? She can't just say like, hey, uh, Deluxe, can you hold my money? Because, you know, there, there's nobody over here. This, this guy is not there. 
But, you know, it, it's trading, so she wants to put in her 10 steam, and, uh, you know, she'll only get like 50 deluxe this time. But there, there's nobody over here yet, so this transaction can't work. But what she can do to initiate, initiate this transaction is send it to the entire network. So since our network of nodes are all processing the same transactions, they can also keep a record of have everybody who has signed these reports, who has access to this network, who has processed these things in the past. And in this case, when Alice is over here with her money, she can send it through Charlie to David. And the only requirement is David has to have more money or more deluxe of this in this case. So Alice is locking, in this case, 10 steam in escrow. And this escrow is being stored between Charlie and David. If something bad here happens, uh, this escrow will be released immediately back to Alice if David does not have as much as this. The, the contract will not be made. Once this contract is made and somebody over here purchases it, in this case Bob, he'll see like, hey, there's a, a contract for 50 Deluxe over here and it's 10 Steam. So he'll throw 50 Deluxe at this contract, which should release these tokens to Dave. Dave also has keys to forward those to Bob. And while this transaction has been initiated by Bob, Dave over here will take his 50 tokens and put it in limbo until this transaction clears. Since a third party is operating on an open market to purchase a fair priced asset with no information asymmetries, this is a fair amount of collateral to hold for this amount of steam because on this side, this is 10 steam. Now, utilizing escrow to hold these capital pools on a decentralized network of like processing software, means that we are trapping this network's liquidity, paying block rewards to everybody over here who is processing these transactions. These transactions are building between themselves a decentralized exchange to provide services between the Steam blockchain and its market cap and the utility of the deluxe token economy and its market cap. And these guys, you know, they all actually live in here. So cool, right? You now have a system to uh, do stuff that, you know, it maintains its token architecture and Steam's token architecture, which we all know, value things based on attention. Uh, but we really haven't talked about what the Deluxe token architecture does other than keeps track of tokens. Because this, this, this infrastructure for computing currently doesn't exist. Um, and that's important because of a few different things. So like, again, in Ethereum, when somebody wants to execute a smart contract, Every node on the Ethereum network needs to process that smart contract in order for the state to change. This means Ethereum is one million times less efficient to run than a normal computer. If, however, complex transactions only needed to be run by a few people to determine consensus on these things, and then they scale at n because again 
there's only three here and not an entire network of all interested participants who all want to put transactions onto the network. These guys can come to conclusions about much larger contracts, much more... Uh, all right, so again, there's only three people that need to run these contracts. Not only do these three people need to run contracts to determine a two-thirds consensus, uh, and really, as soon as you have two people with the same hash of a transaction, then that should be it. Of course, the transactions need to be checked to make sure everything like goes in, equal goes out. Uh, it's not too complex to run a transaction. Um, these transactions could do anything that you want data to do. And in fact, can replace literally every contract type right now. From collateralized loans, to debt instruments, to equity instruments, to scavenger hunts, wills, futures contracts. Um, one of the things that our contracts have to do, like before they do any, like our network does anything that Steam does, because Steam does a great job at what it does. We needed to find a way to provide IPFS services. Because again, there's there's really only two things that a computer needs. I mean, I guess everything's information. But in this case, you need to put, you know, you need the functions and you need the X's. And in this case, IPFS represents the X and the F represents what will run that information. So if you have now F that can be programmed to run any contract and F that can be anything that you can put on the internet, then you've built basically a limitless infrastructure like a computing platform, trust mechanism, consensus machine, uh, whatever you want to call it, that can do for you what it can do for anybody else, which is very important. Um, the paradigm where you design only for yourself means, you know, we're all peers. If it works for you, it works for somebody else. Um, as long as the architecture underneath is scalable, then that's all you really need to test for. If it works for you, it works for anybody. Um, our contracts need a way to store data decentralized because we're not trying to create a company, a profit stream, anything like that. We're trying to create a resource, uh, something that you can use to make your life easier. So in order to facilitate storing content on IPFS, because again, we're not YouTube, we're not in the storage business, we need to make sure that other people are incentivized to store your IPFS content. So as Steam transactions are coming through and those custom JSONs contain hashes, those hashes can be skimmed by one or some of these nodes and put into contracts. These contracts can be auctioned off like on eBay. And by that I mean if somebody sends one token to this contract, and this token will be worth one. If somebody sends two tokens to that contract, that goes back over there, and now two tokens are in this contract. Somebody can send one contract, one token again, and that token will just go right back. So you have an automated contract that will automatically clear at a block time expiration that will then radio out because these guys can only send one transaction every three seconds, which means they really should only be running one contract every three seconds. And these contracts can find out the peer identity of this winner. So whoever wins, put in, in their IPFS peer identity. That the contract can radio out and say, hey, I want to verify that you have these hashes. And if you have those hashes, I will pay you uh, some variety of these tokens. So for instance, once a month I will run this contract and verify that you have this content. At the end of this verification period I will then schedule a release of 
set amount of tokens to your account. Um, so, for instance, if this person, if this contract is set to pay out one token per month for 24 months, then the contract will have 24 tokens in it to secure. Who cares? One one gigabyte of data. The people who auction this contract determine the price of it. So if 12 tokens is what it costs to uh, store it, then these tokens go back to the DAO, and each month they are getting half a token, effectively. Um, this lets the market price IPFS pinning services and people to provide their own input for futures contracts. Uh, this will let us distribute IPFS storage and literally no work for the consumer. If the consumer can make the Steam post, these guys can take the IPFS content, put it into a contract, auction it off, and automate paying that service. The nodes are running themselves. The IPFS is storing itself. The DAO is paying itself. The people who donate are paying themselves. The people who delegate are paying themselves. Um, these contracts could just as easily be any other anything. I mean, it's just, just a data instrument where the goes-ins and the goes-outs. You can give accounts authorities to clear these things, uh, accounts that can be oracles themselves. You can build escrow contracts, again, wills, infrastructure. Um, now back to the cooler thing about this. Like, like I think like all of this stuff is already pretty cool because you, as somebody on the Steam Network, can now run a node that is helping everybody else. So this is like going to the bank to do whatever financial transaction you have to do. Is it a loan? Is it a deposit? Is it a withdrawal? And instead of you know, waiting in line for the teller. Y'all just start interacting with yourselves until all of the business can be done because you're interacting just with yourself. So now because you have these nodes and they're all arriving at consensus on these transactions, great. That is awesome. But what else are they doing? They are literally looking at every transaction on this entire blockchain, which means now, instead of just performing the transactions that make up the um, the edges of the network, like what I mean by the edges, like you have the users, and the users maintain a database between themselves, but the edges of that user database are the Steam database, the Bitcoin database, the Ethereum database. Any, any database that this database talks to to determine the price points those intersections are what determines the overall attention that this asset class can get. This asset class now is paying people to run these nodes. These nodes, uh, much like Bitcoin, uh, determine the value of themselves. So if there's a lot of transactions on the network, more people should be running these nodes to turn their resource credits into DOGS tokens. Um, they're also turning the resource credits into deluxe tokens via uh, signing transactions on the DEX by doing any of this data. The, these transactions out here can also be used to maintain their own databases on the same API. So for instance, if Deluxe um, was running a node and Steam Monsters decided to put their operators on the same transactions, Steam Monsters can in effect be ran on a deluxe node maintaining their database. Their database can be hashed um, and put on to the Steam blockchain and stored here. So if their node ever crashed, when it picked back up and got the head file, well, I haven't even talked about that, these nodes all store their transactions as the hash of the head file. So that if the head file is destroyed because the uh, the computer goes down, they just go look at the last report that they posted, pull this head file out of IPFS, and now they have the state file, the initial conditions for those transactions to determine or redetermine the condition of the state at the present time. 
the hash of the Steam Monsters database in this case can be stored in this exact same way. And when the deluxe node pulls up its initial state, can also pull up the Steam Monster state and start putting its transactions into that database. Now, it doesn't have to be a Steam Monsters database because it can be literally anything. The first thing that I thought of, because uh, we were tasked with finding a content management solution for private content. So now you have each of these databases and they are sending off their deluxe reports for consensus reasons. But our friend will be sending off in his report his CMS information. So his CMS database is actually just a whole bunch of encrypted files and these encrypted files are going to be coming in custom JSON. So the custom JSON is like you know, it'll just say deluxe something for the title, but then it'll have his username and maybe like add CMS. Who knows? Whatever the command is, doesn't matter. We can make them all. So the JSON in here will have, I don't know how many of you guys know what JSON looks like, but say a title for a blog post, uh, an access level, and a body. And this body will be encrypted with the Steam memo keys, so it is an encrypted storage thing. Encrypted, sent out, and signed. So people can search by the title, the program knows the access level, and the body is encrypted. When somebody queries his API, his API says, oh, who's looking for this database? So in here, his private slash at Steam username. And the CMS system doesn't necessarily care who's asking for this information. What it does is it asks itself, does this person have the level of access required? Yep. What is this person's memo key? It then encrypts this content and sends it out. So really the only person who can get this content from this CMS system is somebody with Sun's private memo key. This means that utilizing only custom JSON transactions on Steam you can communicate with your web worker, which is building a private CMS system for you. What your web worker can also do, because if we go back to Deluxe IO, you'll see here that feed and trending and new kind of all look the same because there's not, not a lot of differences in our tags. The the databases that are being maintained by Steam and whatnot to do tag sorting aren't applicable for everybody. This is why Steam Peak uses curation trails or the, the Stevie AI is, is um, curating feeds because the tag system is broken. However, our deluxe node can maintain API endpoints for votable content in our DAO they can maintain a list of all of the Steam posts that are useful or valuable to Deluxe. If you look over here, this isn't far off from an app store. If each one of these things is a VR applet that can do literally anything, you've replaced all of the reasons to have an app store. Each... I haven't even got man. There's just there's just so many cool things that the software can do. So, let's say where was I here? These nodes are now building an API database of content for your main lists. Other things that these nodes can easily do. Um, say you're running a vending machine. And your vending machine has M&Ms. 
and you scan a QR code, and that QR code just instructs someone somewhere, maybe like Steam Connect, to do something. Whatever it does, you can have this looking for these transactions that trigger API endpoints to release your vending machine. You can do a whole mess of things. So uh, our contract structures that should be uh, making IPFS pinning possible could do other things as well. Um, these can pretty easily have um, key pairs in them where you have like a even uh, things that are so cheap that it almost costs you money to ship them back to you to prevent fraud. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, but I know any anybody who's in business knows what I'm talking about here. Your item costs one dollar to make, and it costs five dollars to ship. Which means if somebody purchased your item for $10 and they have to ship that item back to you and you have to ship a new item to them, you have lost all of your profits and then some just in shipping. Whereas if your $1 item costs $5 ship, it breaks and instead you can obsolete, obsolete the item that is broken and just send them a new item, then you have saved yourself an extra $5 in return shipping. That that can really add up. So, utilizing key mechanisms inside of Internet of Things devices, you can have NFTs that you can operate, say like the bird scooter concept. NFTs operate autonomous cars. Um, any any number of things. These these feeds can do a lot. Um, imagine, if you will, um, sorry. This this is one of the only things that I I I think is left that a, the infrastructure is necessary but doesn't yet exist. I think that we can replace almost every single um, service that our government provides via voluntary interactions. But besides all of the financial security that we have, the thing that is lacking is physical security. So what would be really nice is if your phone just had a button and on that button, it's an emergency key, whatever, and it sent out your next to kin and your 12 closest people a one-way audio conversation. And these guys all got a text chat. So somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night. You don't necessarily want anybody to... Hmm. know what's going on. So, like, you, you can't talk, but you definitely want he people to hear. One-way audio. You don't want people to make noise. You don't want them to rely on your directions. One-way audio. Um, of course, if somebody petitions to say, like, hey, I'd like to, like, talk you through whatever you're going through, um, of course, why not? But you have next to kin, because next to kin can get stuff started with information that these guys probably don't have. Also, if these guys, let's say you're in some kind of a weird situation, these guys might all be confederated. You still want your emergency contact to know what's going on when you have your emergency situation. This, this is ultimately what makes me really happy because the biggest most horrific everything bad it seems only happens in the absence of good people so if this is a home invasion if this is a back alley rape if this is whatever your emergency is 
you're literally just going to invite a jury of your peers and your next to kin, your emergency contract, there. Um, broadcast it out and really make the, the community as a whole um, more secure. So there we have it. Blockchain can easily connect people. Um, and while I haven't worked out all of the kinks for this, this is one thing I really want to do. Physical security, because there's really just not a lot left as far as financial security goes. Um, Location-based experience. So, so World IA Day is coming up. In fact, I have a meeting for it in six hours. During this World IA Day, our NFT is going to be used, hopefully, to run a scavenger hunt. So this NFT is going to have a key inside of it. And this key will be paired to a key that is actually on their invitation. So when they get to the conference, when you get to the conference, you're going to get a brochure, whatever, your information packet for Steam. Your Steam information packet is going to have some information about Steam. So like, say, don't lose your keys. Don't do this, that, or the other. Steam's ad-free, censorship-free, this, that, the other, freemium. It's awesome, right? Steam's the future. Cool. It's also going to have a little bit of information about Deluxe and this experience. The Deluxe experience that we're creating revolves around our token architecture. The token architecture that enables NFT smart contracts and our Deluxe uh, DApp framework that enables AR web apps. So their brochure will have their account creation. When they get to us at our table, we are going to make them scan a QR code. QR code will bring up a web app. The web app, they will then say, hey, I would like my Steam username to be whatever. User one, check. They then present us a QR code, and that QR code will contain all the public keys and that account name. We will then send that off to the Steam blockchain, um, becoming the account creator for this new username. Now they have a brand new Steam account <coughs> that can do roughly 30 transactions. Six of those transactions, we're going to hope are custom chase on transactions. The Steam user will first take their username and hash it with the I think that's right. All right. Um, private public key cryptography. I'm not entirely sure if this is 100% accurate, but I know that there is a type of key pair that will work for this. So here we go. The contract has one half of a key that can verify that the key that is on the physical asset was hashed by the user. This will transfer ownership of the NFT from Deluxe or World IA Day, whoever has ownership as the creator, to the user. At this point, the NFT will only take transactions from the user, whereas before they would only take transactions from Deluxe or the person who had the public key to transfer the ownership to them. This person can also set this contract back for sale. Hopefully they don't do that. But, of course, as an asset, you need to be able to buy, trade, sell, destroy, whatever these assets are. Um, and, of course, 
the goes ins have to equal the goes outs. So in this case, these contracts are going to say have like ten dollars tokens in them. And every time one of the uh, AR markers that we've programmed around the experience is found and signed by our user, the contract will get a checkbox. And by that I mean there is going to be a payout table. This payout table will constantly be updated based on these check-ins. And at, at expiration time, Deluxe, or World IA Day, will get their tokens back, and the user will get these tokens, and whatever else the contract may contain. So here is a cryptographic way to run a location-based experience with a sidechain, with soft and hard consensus, on a distributed computing platform inside of an augmented reality container on the decentralized storage platform. You could, in theory, pull this up without ever using an HTTP request. Is that true? Not quite. You could oh. nope, 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 nope. QR code requires SSL, unfortunately. But mostly decentralized way to provide consensus for all parties involved. What else did I want to talk about? Mm. All right, so yeah, so Deluxe is infrastructure for tomorrow. It does P2P services and P2P services. I mean, P2P and P through P. There we go. So single sign-on dApp provider. dApps can be VR, AR, web apps. DApp Inception is something I haven't talked about, but what this is is the ability for these these apps here can all right. So you have deluxe.io and you, the super whamadine entrepreneur you are, have made a D app that is absolutely fantastic. What this D app does is whenever somebody looks at it on our feed is it displays a picture. And on that picture you can put sunglasses, whatever. It's the sunglassinator. You can put sunglasses on a photo. And then get people to comment on that photo and whatever. People absolutely love it. The cooler thing about this is, is that everybody who uses this D app, as in everybody who goes to this place and loads up this thing and sees how awesome your app is, can just push the button that you programmed in to have this D app say, "Hey, can I, uh, can I make a post to Steam?" And then the user, your your uh, your user down here, so your D app, your D app, is in the user's single sign-on D app container that doesn't have access to the Steam wallet. But it can ask. It can say, hey, hey user, you wanted to post this app on your, uh, your page, right? So it can upload itself to IPFS. It can feed in custom information that the new user, the user of your D app, needs to make this dApp his. So now this dApp lives in IPFS, referenced on 
your new user's name. So instead of, for instance, Deluxe IO posting this app, Disregard Fiat can post this app. Using no upload infrastructure to your D app. So you, all you did was make, you can use Microsoft Word, you can use WordPad, Text Editor, Atom, anything to make this D app. You can do it on your mobile phone. You can upload this D app on your mobile phone without downloading any software, any infrastructure, anything, period. Upload that to IPFS, reference that on Deluxe.io, push post. Post on Steam. Deluxe.io web app worker should take this IPFS hash, put it into a contract, and store it for you. Since on Deluxe.io, these beneficiary rewards are coming to Deluxe.io, as well as the proceeds from the contract, which will eventually fairly price uh, storage on the network. Nothing. You have all you needed was a word processor, literally a, a web browser, and you have built a D app that a user can replicate and post for themselves. And you can even pay yourself to provide this service. So when this person over here puts a hat, nice little like sailor hat, on on their picture, and everybody can see that, that person is also, when that D app gets copied, virally recreated, that also gets paid to you in a beneficiary fee because 10% goes to Deluxe.io to pay for IPFS and all the other fun stuff we're doing. And you can set your beneficiary fee at 90% for all we care. It's the blockchain. If somebody wants to replicate your app and pay you 90% and get absolutely nothing for anybody, they can do that. You can do that. We, we of course, recommend 10%, 5%, 20%, whatever, what, what your app does. Because... In the end, this person can just copy your code anyway and not pay you anything. Most people aren't that silly, but in the end, you're talking about code. Once it's made, the only thing that matters is who posts it first. Where did this idea come from? Who do we get to credit? Because money is just going to go away. Everything that we can replicate can just be replicated for free at this point. Food, water, there's... <laughs> Like, it's absolutely mind-boggling to me how, how we have people who are like, we can't survive in a single-income household anymore. How in the world? It's not like it takes more people to feed us now. In fact, less people are involved with feeding us than ever. What, what happened to our productivity where we can't feed and clothe ourselves on a single income in a household? How how are we not doing this on a single income in like a year in a household? Like there's not enough work that needs to be going around. Everything that we're doing now is creating and people are starving. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. All right. So that's that's dApp Inception, where with absolutely no infrastructure, you can build a viral app, get paid. Um, Internet of Things uh, talked a little bit about that, where a contract can have its own keys. Uh, you can put, say, your smart clapper at home. It's not a smart clapper anymore. Now it turns on your lights whenever you clap your hands on your phone. But in this case, you put your private keys on the blockchain and the Internet of Things device can see that whoever has sent it information is coming from a, an authorized user. Uh, like we can fix Internet of Things security with blockchains pretty easily. Uh, smart media tokens don't have a DEX, so they are basically ERC-20 chains. Uh, side chains are cool. They operate really anything. We can do literally anything with a side chain. We can replicate any financial instrument with, with side chain. Dex explained how the Dex operates here. Um, build out that decentralized computer. Sorry, distributed computer, not a decentralized computer. Um, 
it's like a parallel processor if you want to call it that. Smart contracts, the, the architecture that enables the DEX enables smart contracts. Uh, the smart contracts solve our IPFS problem. The nodes can be used to make individual CMS, so have CMS that pays you, and those CMS systems. Ooh, AR point of sale. Um, another thing. So, like I say, um, those menu systems that can have tables and stores um, could just as easily say like on a vending machine, anything, any any interaction that you could possibly have with somebody can be replicated in augmented reality. And instead of purchasing point of sale terminals or cash drawers or anything like that, use your customer's phone. Like, at the worst case, show them a QR code on your phone. Um, better case, laminate a sticker to each table. Lam like, what is it's just a QR code at this point. You don't need to purchase a lot of trash that just goes into a landfill in a few years. Uh, location based experiences, e even better. Um, drive customer interaction and engagements and use their hardware to do it. Um, like a VR game show, again, if if this is what virtual reality looks like, you, there's there's avatars and stuff in here. Um, voice you can, you can see people in here uh, and then live vote you can play Jeopardy in here and everybody can get answer for whatever 90% of people get it wrong you can give a lot of money to the one person who gets it right mm, back over here so game shows smart contracts for table games so these NFT solutions that uh, like I said you can update several people so like say you have a game of sit and go poker Eight people can send a contract, 100 tokens each, and then that contract can cash people out if, say, two-thirds of the table sends the same cash-out transaction. So build a smart contract that the table can play, and then at the end of the game, everybody can report the final transactions, and then you get paid. Don't rely on a casino. Don't use a rake. Just free poker between people um, no infrastructure like nothing no illegality because nothing just decentralized trust mm, vending machines uh, activation I mentioned kind of like how this would work in uh, obsolescence of devices that would normally have to be returned but you can do the same thing with like activation of devices, um, especially something that you would like put on a store shelf that only works if you have keys for it, I guess, like subscription things. Uh, the, the square reader is the closest thing that I can think of like that. Like the square reader is just this thing that probably costs only like 10 cents to make, but it really only works for you if you have a square app kind of thing. So you put a device out, it has tons of utility if you can use it, and now you can activate those things with blockchain. Uh, yeah, same thing with insurance and fraud prevention. Um, you can um, obsolete things without having to replace them and prevent people from doing certain kinds of things. All right, um, I think that's... Uh, a fairly decent overview of everything we got going on. Um, I wonder how long I've been talking. Jeez, an hour and a half. All right, well, I'll stop now.